Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities on Our Own Devices. I'm Jean Messier, and today we're having a look at a fascinating mineral. This is a piece of Iceland spar, and this is the clear variety of the mineral calcite, which is itself the crystalline form of calcium carbonate, aka limestone. Now, this might not look like much, but this mineral actually changed the face of science and technology, being directly or indirectly responsible for dozens of important discoveries across multiple fields. And to show you why this mineral is so special, let's actually put it on a page of text, and you'll see that it produces a double image. This is a property known as birefringence, and figuring out what was responsible for this phenomenon resulted in a major revolution in the study of optics. Now, Iceland spar has been known about for centuries, and the name comes from the fact that the first high-quality examples were discovered around Reidafjordur in Iceland. And I apologize for the pronunciation there. I actually don't speak Icelandic. However, since then, deposits have been discovered all over the world, including in China, Russia, South Africa, Brazil, Mexico, and the southern United States. But it really wasn't until the 17th century that scientists began investigating the curious optical properties of Iceland spar in any detail. And among the first to write about this mineral was Rasmus Bartholin in 1669. And he realized that this birefringent property violated something called Snell's Law, which describes how light refracts through clear materials. And he realized that because this splits light into two beams, maybe Snell's Law was not nearly as accurate or as universal as scientists thought. However, he was not able to come up with any explanation for this phenomenon. Now, the next major scientist to tackle this problem was Christian Huygens in 1690. And what he discovered is that if you take two pieces of Iceland spar, put them on top of one another and rotate them relative to one another, at certain angles, the double image will disappear. And he came up with some mathematical models uh, to describe this, but he also wasn't able to come up with any convincing theory as to why this occurred. And you'll see this throughout the history of science where scientists will come up with a very accurate and useful mathematical model of something without knowing exactly what's going on under the hood, so to speak. So one of the major complicating factors in the investigation of birefringence was the debate over the nature of light itself. Certain scientists thought that light was a wave, kind of like a sound wave traveling through an invisible medium called the luminiferous ether. Whereas other scientists believed that it was composed of particles, what they called corpuscles, or today we would call photons. And indeed, Sir Isaac Newton, who was a proponent of the corpuscular theory, came up with a possible explanation for birefringence. And what he believed was that these light corpuscles were bipolar. They had two different ends to them, almost like a magnet with two poles. And depending on what orientation they entered the Iceland spar crystal, they would be deflected by one angle or another. And this seemed to be a very neat explanation and lent credence to the corpuscular theory. However, in 1801, the scientist Thomas Young conducted the classic double slit experiment, whereby through the demonstration of the principle of interference, he seemed to have very clearly demonstrated that light was in fact a wave. And today we know that light can behave both as a particle and a wave, depending on how it's observed, thanks to the wonders of quantum mechanics. Now, it would be another 10 years before another piece of evidence came along that would start to crack open the mystery of birefringence. And this was an accidental discovery made by a French scientist named Étienne-Louis Malu. And as the story goes, Malu was experimenting in his laboratory at the Luxembourg Palace in Paris when he noticed that the light reflecting off the window of his laboratory didn't produce a double image when viewed through a piece of Iceland spar. And he developed a number of formulas to model this phenomenon, but like his predecessors, were not able to come up with a cohesive theory to explain it. It would be yet another 10 years until somebody finally did. And you'll probably recognize this person who's appeared in a previous video. This was Augustin Fresnel, the inventor of the Fresnel lens. And Fresnel explained the phenomenon by postulating that light consisted of two light waves traveling at right angles to one another. And what happened inside Iceland spar is that light traveling in one direction would be bent at a certain angle and light traveling in the other direction would be bent at another angle, forming what are known as the ordinary and extraordinary rays. 
And what Fresnel had discovered was the principle of the polarization of light. And this handily explained the phenomena that were observed by Huygens, Malu, and others. So for example, in the case of Huygens, what was happening was that at a certain alignment, the crystals caused one of the two rays, the extraordinary or the ordinary ray, to be deflected out through the side of the crystal while allowing only one of those rays to go through into the observer's eye. So you would only see a single image because there weren't two beams in order to make the double image. Whereas in Malu's case, when light reflects off of reflective surfaces such as glass or a body of water, it tends to become polarized in one direction or another. And we can observe this phenomenon by having a look at some modern polarizing filters. Uh, these are off a pair of sunglasses. Now, polarizing filters on sunglasses are typically polarized vertically. They only allow vertically polarized light to go through. And this is because light reflecting off of bodies of water or cars or other horizontal surfaces tend to be horizontally polarized. And if you cut out all that light, you can cut out most of the glare that causes eye strain. So if we take these filters and we align them along their polarization direction, you will see that they are blocking out all the horizontally polarized light and lighting all the vertically polarized light through. But if we turn one of the filters 90 degrees that is now horizontally polarized, it is going to block out both polarizations of light and thus block out most of the light. So light polarization would turn out to be a monumental discovery, not only in optics, but other fields of science. And its measurement, a field known as polarimetry, an extremely powerful analytical tool. Indeed, polarization and transverse waves would be one of the first pieces of evidence suggesting that light is actually a form of electromagnetic radiation. A couple of decades later, in 1845, the great English scientist Michael Faraday would discover that the polarization angle of light passing through a transparent material could be altered by the application of a magnetic field, suggesting that there was some link between light and electromagnetism. And later, the Scottish physicist James Clerk Maxwell would combine all of this evidence into his grand unified theory of electromagnetism, which showed that all forms of electromagnetism going from gamma rays to visible light all the way to microwaves are composed of two transverse waves and can be polarized. And these discoveries just opened the floodgates for investigation in multiple fields of science and industry. For example, scientists discovered that sunlight reflecting off the moon, off of the tails of comets being scattered through the atmosphere, what we call Raleigh scattering, polarizes the light. They found that different chemical solutions and different minerals also affected the polarization of light. And this led to development in industries such as the sugar industry or the brewing and winemaking industry, because with a polarimeter, you could determine the concentration of a sugar solution and thus the amount of alcohol it would yield uh, when it was fermented more accurately than ever before. So it led to a great amount of standardization in those industries. You could use polarimetry to determine the purity of drugs, to find imperfections in lenses and other optical instruments, and to find mechanical stresses in transparent objects. If uh, you take an object made out of clear plastic and you look at it through a polarizing filter, you will see these concentric rainbow rings that show where all the stress concentrations are. And so it's a great tool for structural analysis. Now, all of this was made possible by the development of the first practical polarizing filter, which was made from Iceland spar. And this was developed in 1828 by one William Nickel, who took a piece of Iceland spar, split it at a 68 degree angle, and glued the two pieces back together with an adhesive known as Canadian balsam. And what this did is it caused one of the two rays to be reflected out of the crystal while letting the other through, creating a polarized filter that could be rotated to different orientations to alter the degree of polarization. And one of the first fields that this was used in was geology, because different minerals, when cut in thin sections, can be identified by how they respond to polarized light. And although we use more sophisticated polarizing filters today, in geological notation, the symbol XN still stands for crossed Nichols filters. Now, one of the most interesting early proposals for the use of polarizing filters was made in 1894 by one John Anderton. And what he invented was a system for projecting 3D images. 
And this consisted of a projector or magic lantern with two projection lenses, each projecting a different image taken at slightly different angles, a stereograph. One lens had a vertically polarized filter, the other had a horizontally polarized filter. And the viewer would don a pair of goggles that had a pair of Nichols prism also oriented at 90 degrees to one another. And what this meant was that one eye would see one polarized image and the other eye would see the other and the brain would combine them into a 3D image. Now, given the cost and the weight of Nichols prisms, this was never going to be a practical invention and it really never went anywhere. But if you've ever been to a 3D movie lately, uh, this is exactly the principle behind the real D system. Only today we have much thinner and more practical plastic polarization filters. So speaking of these filters, these were first patented in 1929 by an American inventor named Edwin Land. And these are composed of fine particles of a chemical called iodoquinine sulfate, which is dichroic, suspended in clear celluloid plastic. And Land sold these under his company's name, Polaroid. And you'll probably recognize that name. This is because Land is also the inventor of the instant photography system that we associate with the name Polaroid today. But back in the day, Polaroid was more closely associated with its polarization filter technology. And during the Second World War, they manufactured a large variety of products based on this technology for the U.S. Armed Forces. Things like polarized sunglasses and goggles for pilots. Some of them were even adjustable. They had rotating filters that you could adjust the darkness by crossing the filters. And they produced polarization filters for periscopes, binoculars, rangefinders, gun sights. They produced a system for viewing uh, aerial reconnaissance photos in 3D that was very similar to that 3D projection system that I was talking about before. And they also produced an interesting type of gun sight. Now, many episodes ago, we covered the history of reflector or reflex gun sights. And these produce a reticle that is focused at infinity, meaning that it is not subject to parallax. You can move your head around and the reticle stays still, making it much easier to aim. The problem with these, though, is that they were bulky, they were complicated, they required an external power source. And so Land developed a much simpler type of gun sight, which consisted of multiple polarization filters sandwiched together. And this produced a series of concentric rainbow rings that were focused at infinity and basically served the same purpose as a more complicated reflector gun sight. And these were typically used on anti-aircraft guns as a backup sight. Now, I've only recently learned about these, and I haven't found a lot of information online about them. So if anybody watching knows where I can find one, or at least look at one, please let me know, because I'd really like to cover that on this channel. So this is just a brief overview, but I hope that it demonstrates the outsized impact that Iceland spar and the phenomenon of birefringence had on multiple fields of science and technology. However, my favorite story associated with Iceland spar regards its possible use as a navigation instrument in antiquity. You see, in the Viking sagas, they talk about something called the sunstone, which was a mineral that was supposedly used by Viking navigators to find their way when it was overcast or the sun was below the horizon. In the Rafn saga, for example, it says... The weather was thick and stormy. The king looked about and saw no blue sky. Then the king took the sunstone and held it up, and then he saw where the sun beamed from the stone. Now, for many years, the sunstone was thought to be merely a mythological object. But in 1967, a Danish archaeologist named Thorkild Ramsku put forward a theory that the sunstone was actually a piece of Iceland spar. And the theory goes that when sunlight is scattered through the atmosphere, it polarizes the light. And this holds even when the sky is overcast or when the sun is below the horizon. So theoretically, and Ramsku demonstrated this was possible, you could take a piece of Iceland spar and by sweeping it across the horizon, you could find the point at which the double image disappeared. And this would give you the polarization of sunlight and be able to give you a compass heading along an east-west axis. But while this is a highly plausible and very tantalizing theory, unfortunately there is no solid archaeological evidence for it, since no piece of Iceland spar has ever been discovered in a Viking burial or settlement. However, in 1977, the wreck of the English ship Alderney, which sank off the Channel Islands in 1592, was discovered. And among the wreckage, archaeologists discovered a piece of Iceland spar 
in close proximity to some navigational instruments, which suggests that even at this late date, European navigators were still making use of a sunstone for navigation, probably as a backup instrument. This was relatively shortly after the magnetic compass was introduced to Europe, and so they probably weren't quite comfortable yet with this new instrument, and were falling back on older techniques when necessary. And they probably learned this technique from the Vikings, although we don't have any solid evidence of that either. But still, tantalizing piece of evidence and a fascinating archaeological mystery. But whether or not the Vikings used polarization for navigation, the principle itself is fundamentally sound. Indeed, in 1846, the inventor Charles Wheatstone created what's known as the polar clock, which used the polarization of sunlight to determine the time of day, even when the sun had dipped below the horizon. And a hundred years later, in 1948, a Dr. A. H. Fund of John Hopkins University created the sky compass, which allows you to determine your orientation using the same method. And if I ever come across any of those instruments, you can be sure I will feature them on this channel. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time on another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities on our own devices, where we'll look at yet more minerals, devices, and all sorts of other interesting things. Until then, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.